But we'll get started with episode 21, right? Yeah, if you I'm tie excited. in the weeds, we'll uh, we have a we have a special guest today, Mandy. How do you pronounce your last name? Mandy Kerr, right? Yep. Mandy okay, Kerr. Mandy Kerr. Yep. Uh, you well, let me. And she's a CBD wizard. She is the C. Is that how we should label this episode? Yep. The CBD wizard. The CBD wizard. Well, you're people, actually the co-founder of Utah CBD Collective. Is is right. uh, what I have you as a title of, right? Yep. How did that happen? What talk? Let's let's jump right there. Is that a good yeah, place to absolutely. start? Absolutely. I and um, this is the whole reason why I wanted you on the show. Like I wanted to know how somebody gets into this, and like what? Well, and what's going on in it? I okay. guess yes, I'm interested. Okay. So I, I've always been passionate about the hemp and cannabis space, but very uneducated about the space. Um, but for the last four years, I've done B2B networking and events for lead generation. Um, and so I grew a network pretty quick working at Top Golf, hosting 15 to 20 events a month. Um, and when I entered a cannabis event working for merchant processing, um, I learned really quick the pain points in cannabis or in the industry are completely different from the industry like or from tech or any of these others. And so, uh, for example, the banking space, just the lack of access to banking and payment solutions, um, instead of you know, fighting for a quarter of a percent when you're going into sell merchant processing, it really was providing a solution for somebody to run a business. And so it really changed my perspective as to why I was there and noticed really quick the lack of leadership or consistency, I guess, in the industry between, you know, marketing is a good example, right? Is you can't post or put money behind ads on social media that say anything cannabis or CBD or canna or marijuana. And yeah, so I realized the pain points and- I don't think a lot of people realize that. I don't think a lot of people yeah, like know- Yeah, like I want to back right up to the merchant processing thing because I think there's a lot of people who are like, oh, well, CBD, I just buy it at Walgreens, just normal. But that's not how it's always been. And it's still not that way. Right, right, right. You're talking about, on the one hand, somebody trying to get a quarter percent less deal on their merchant processing in a normal business, and on the CBD side, not being able to sell it. At all. And I think the biggest thing for me is when I left that first event and I came back and I would try to explain to people that are not in the industry what I saw or what was being experienced, they immediately go to, well, it's just because they're a bad business. It's because they're doing something wrong. But it's not doing something wrong. It really is that there are these limitations put on the industry that have been real pain points, even down to PACA. I don't know if you guys are familiar with PACA. No. PACA, PACA, PACA provides, I don't know if it's an insurance policy, but it provides protection in the agricultural department or agricultural industry so that if, Tim, you and I make a deal and I'm going to buy a thousand pounds of tomatoes and I don't follow through with that or you don't follow through at the end, I'm able to pierce that that corporate veil and actually go after you as the person purchasing or selling the product. That does not include at all. It actually excludes everything hemp and cannabis. So in this industry, you know as well as I do, the ups and downs and the ebb and flow in the price. If I make an agreement in the cannabis space to buy a thousand pounds of your flour at $300 a pound and the market drops to $100 a pound or $150 a pound is what I'm seeing now, right? We There's no protection for either of us on that deal on the federal level or the big scale. And there is in every other industry. What kind of protection? Why would you need protection though? For what reason? Um, if I make an agreement to buy, say, 500 bales of hay mm -hmm. and you grow and bale your hay and don't sell or pursue a contract with anyone else. And I come to back and say, well, I know that we had an agreement for $300 a, bar a barrel, but now the price is $90 a barrel. So I'm going to buy from this guy who's selling it for $87 a barrel anyway. Who cares about the contract? There is nothing to protect me. Because it's CBD. Because it's hemp or cannabis. Hemp and cannabis, CBD. Yeah. Interesting. Right? And so those types of things really quick, I just realized like our system is so broken. The banking alone, say there's $80 billion in the industry and they're running in suitcases. I know they still across are. The there's streets. just so much cash in those pharmacies and it's just dangerous. Like it's, it is so hard to do business. And with any type of cash now, 
I mean, just you can't even buy your groceries with cash now because there's there's a so-called sh- coin shortage, which I think is a total separate issue. But nobody likes to take cash because of COVID. Right. Well, and I think so that- it's even worse. Who even keeps cash on them anymore, though, really? Well, and look at some of this. This happened to a local a local cannabis company here, extraction facility. When COVID happened, how do you pay payroll with cash? How do you deposit $50,000 a week through a drive through to pay your payroll? Right. Wow. And a lot of people, especially people that are listening because they might just be patients or just regular people, they're not connected to this. They don't know all the obstacles. All they're going to do is complain. You know, you hear, oh, well, this such and such is taking a while to get open or this is going on. It's like, well, these are the reasons right? Right. because of this. So what is it? What is the answer? For what part? To make this easier. So to make it so we don't have to deal with just cash, to make it so we can just be a normal business. I think that there has to be, I mean, we opened an industry and legalized hemp uh, to be ran as a commodity, basically, without a foundation. And I'm learning, I'm not an expert in this. JD is a great, great contact for this. But, you know, he said something really, really, that really stood out to me is, you know, up to the level of the USDA and FDA, the way that rules and, and regulations have put in place for, say, a vitamin versus a medicine Cannabis or hemp is technically both of those. And right now, if a vitamin is a vitamin, it cannot be a medicine and vice versa. And so down to the level of where the FDA decides, hey, what we've said previously is or is not accurate changes whether or not we can open it up as a consumable for a vitamin versus a medicine. And now that it's the main ingredient in an epidiolect, CBD, that it is classified as a drug, not just a vitamin or a CBD, CBD is, is mm-hmm. yeah, because CBD a is because CBD is used in epidiolex, which is now FDA approved as and a drug. That basically, defaults the rest of CBD in the nation as a drug. Bingo. Boom. Okay, and now you're now you run an association. Essentially, you run a pharmacist group. You're going to need a bunch of pharmacists. Interesting. So Mandy I runs a, ph- a pharmacist. Group? No, oh. she runs the CBD collective. The, the CBD collective, huh. which right now, when we and I've been to these, right? In fact, I think I, I saw you there. No, no, I don't um, think I've been yet. Anyway, when we went to the to the one that we had, right? Uh-huh. There's no. I was the only medical provider there. Not a lot of medicine. Yeah, people mm-hmm. in that group, mm-hmm. but that probably needs to change. Do you think that's the case? I do. I think that it needs a strong representation, right? Um, We were kind of talking about this before we came online or before we went live is um, there's a good representation nationally and even globally around the health and wellness um, piece for, for cannabis or hemp, in my opinion. It should be better, yes, but where I think that there's a big lack is in the industrial side, right? And so- um, That's where we've actually transitioned from Utah CBD Collective to the Association of Hemp Associations, like we talked about, um, with representation for everything hemp, right? And so our goal is to, whether it's health and wellness, the CBD, the the lobbying on that aspect, or home building, sustainability, plastics, fibers, everything like that. You trying to get out of the medicine business, or essentially like solve the problem from a from a much bigger perspective, right? Very different angle. Um, yeah. Somebody asked me a while back what I felt like the solution was to bridge the gap between those that are turned away from or unwilling to come on board or open up or even admit that they're using. They may be using CBD, but not recognizing sure. they're actually using a hemp or cannabis product. Um, and I believe for me, it's, or where I see a lot of opportunity is approaching it from the other side of building homes, sustainability, and economic growth and development. Oh yeah. This is a really, so this is fascinating to me because it really is, it's something no one could complain about, right? And I mean, when you talk about what you can do with hemp, so t- tell us all the things I mean, tell us the main things that like people are working on with hemp so to, I, to make our lives better or different. 
you know, when I say getting away from CBD, I feel like there's a good voice for it, right? Everybody that I know when I say, oh, I run CBD Collective or I'm in the hemp, they say, oh, you use CBD or oh, you smoke or oh, you do, you know, you, you're, you know, the Rasta. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but again, where I am is the, you know, homes. Uh, there's a gentleman that I've met and done a display with under 7,000 plus degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit for nine hours. It was one sixteenth of an inch in damage, direct flame under direct flame. And so the hemp crete, right, that they can make yeah. homes with for nine hours will burn at 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit under direct flame with no damage. Um, it's mold proof, right? It's antimicrobial. Um, so fabrics, plastics, anything that you see basically can be made out of, out of, hemp. out of hemp. Yeah. Um, so the, the drywall, think about drywall right now, drywall gets wet. It molds really fast, right? It's, um, damage easy. You can take from field to Home Depot drywall that's antimicrobial. You can get wet a hundred times. It doesn't matter. It's a tenth of the cost. And then you go to like the carbon footprint of hemp. You know, what does hemp do for our planet? It's one twentieth of the water for cotton. Cotton currently is is one third of the world's pesticides. So if we can substitute our hemp and start our mills, you know, milling our fabric out of hemp instead, right? right? And this is where it really gets tricky is, you know, we talk about our tribes and sustainability and jobs, um, that we can provide by growing hemp and what we do now to the carbon footprint around places like Duchesne and Roosevelt or Uena Basin, their air quality is, I mean, one of the biggest concerns, right? right. Yep. And so by planting hemp and then allowing their tribes to manufacture or break down and process their hemp fiber, and hemp fiber grows very different. You know, I don't know how familiar... I'm, I'm not, no, not, I mean, not we're, super for teach us. Yeah, help, teach. Yeah. Come on, let's yeah, bring it on. I mean, I, here I am thinking, well, is this the type of stuff like when the growers, you know, have all this waste in the in the cannabis facilities? I mean, I would guess that's a piece of it, but these plants are different. That's uh, what you're They're this they're the same, I mean, they're just same grown family. different. Yes, right. Yeah. So a fiber stalk or a hemp stalk that's grown for fiber grows like a bamboo. It's really tall, you know, 10 feet tall. You can put thousands of plants on an acre. It's not, I mean, you literally throw it out and you grow it like, like a weed. Um, it's harvested like a corn or a hay, right? It's baled and broken down and then processed. And based on the quality of it, of the stock is what it's processed into. So it could be clothing or um, fabrics or, or sorry, fabrics or oils or plastics or construction material or hempcrete, um, things like that. And so- Wow. That, but it's a like the the amount of work to break it down, is this something that's that's cheap or- like a, we need to find our way again. Uh, I think a little bit of both, right? It's definitely going to be a capital infusion that's needed or required. And and really, I think, you know, when we go back to this opportunity that's come up around the pandemic and us being shut down, it really has shown us where our supply chains are broken, right? And so in order to bring our supply chain back into the United States for anything we're doing or fix any of our problems around the lithium mines or our air quality or, um, you know, our oil and gas, you mm -hmm. know, problems, if we're cut off, we, we have to substitute or find something and we literally can grow our energy again, grow our resolution. And so I think that bringing it back into the United States is going to be a capital infusion regardless of what it is. It's just a matter of. Hemp is legal in all 50 states, right? Mm -hmm. So people can grow in all 50 mm -hmm. states. So why isn't this being made? Why are, why aren't we? Yeah. Making, what's the hold up? Yeah. Why are, what's the hold up? <laughs> this question comes up a lot. I actually had a really good discussion today about this and yesterday in the cannabis and hemp industry, I think you guys have seen this a yeah. lot, right? A lot of people saw the gold rush or the green rush. They dumped in, they grew cannabis, they had a great, a great season. And then who was going to extract it or who was going to buy it or what happened in the supply chain or shoot. Now there's this influx of product and now the price has dropped and everybody lost, right? Um, with the manufacturing, you know, it's not a, we will grow and they will come. In the manufacturing space, I really believe it's we have to build and our farmers are going to grow it, right? If 
inside our United or inside the state of Utah, right? We're looking at our rural development. Our tribes are desperate for sustainable housing. We can build homes for a 20th or a 10th of the cost out of hemp that last way longer. We just need the capital infusion in order to put, yeah. put the facility in, right? And it's happening all over. They're, they're popping up everywhere. I interviewed somebody just the other day from Australia that built the first manufacturing facility for industrial hemp out of Australia. And with what's happening between them and China. So they have a, they have a facility in Australia to manufacture hemp, turn it into like wood or whatever, I guess you turn it into. and So it depends on what the facility is, but it's similar to a, the health and wellness side, uh, right? When you're extracting hemp, yeah. um, you can extract it fully vertically integrated, mm. or you can buy biomass and then extract, or you can plant and buy flour, right? Um, you can, with industrial hemp, you, there's different facilities where you can break it down into different types of fiber and based on the quality of fiber it depends on who's buying it or where it's going. So if I'm a fiber, if I'm breaking down the fiber in the manufacturing facility, it's to me what I would explain like the extraction facility, Yeah. right? Yeah. It's that middle piece of the distribution channel. And then from there, I would sell it to Tesla or I would mm. sell it to Coca-Cola for plastic bottles, or I would sell it to Levi or Pand uh, Patagonia or a fabric mill, right? Mm. Right. Yeah. I mean, and you see more and more, at least I do in the, in the circles I keep, I guess, but I see more and more of these ads for hemp products, mm -hmm. right? The hemp bottle, like you said, like the Coca-Cola bottle that's, that's made out of hemp or the, you know, the coffee cups in your, in your office, you know, go away from the styrofoam, the plastic, mm -hmm. and even the paper and start using hemp. But you're, I mean, I see your point. Like it's not, it costs a lot of money to get these facilities put together. And when I was trying to find, for example, business card stock, that's hemp, man, that's not, it's not easy. There's a lot of things that you can't find that are. That well, are and this is where it's hard, right? When we go back to marketing, if I'm selling business cards and I, and I want to launch a business selling paper business cards, I can put ads be behind it and everybody knows then that I sell business cards. Oh, you make a good point. Yeah. Cause I There's can't buy nowhere a Google click ad that's like, Hey, come buy this hemp, cannabis brand, cannabis brand, whatever business card, anything. Yeah. And I Nor get that because, is there anywhere for me to go and search. Yeah. Right? Okay. So this brings up like we should tell, I think listeners need to understand this and I'm not sure we've talked about this before, Chris, mm. but basically it's like, if we want to boost, we have a webpage, Utah in the weeds, which seems benign. That's fine. And then we want to go and put a Google ad and do like, come to the top, right? This is what you're mm -hmm. talking about. And mm -hmm. we say, Utah in the weeds, we talk about cannabis, everything cannabis in Utah. Nope. Google won't let me post the ad mm -hmm. because cannabis, the word cannabis, use the word cannabis, hemp, marijuana, shut you down. Yeah. It's the same reason you're, uh, and, and it's a totally legal now, discussion. once they decriminalize it, though, or change it from a Schedule 1, it should be legal to do ads, then I would imagine, right? Because it's a federal thing is what I would imagine that's what is we, what's holding it back. I mean, that's what you assume. They can take money. I mean, certainly you can buy a billboard, and whoever owns the billboard, they can put up marijuana if you want, and they can take your money and put a print ad in. But but these national companies, and do you feel like that's right, Mandy? Mm -hmm. the, it's the national companies that are restricting the advertising yeah, it's on the Google, and I'm not positive as to the ins and outs of why, but I know anything on Google and or Facebook, Facebook social oh, Facebook media, and Facebook goes down to, for six months. Yeah, I'm I'm banned, and I don't sell anything CBD, but my name is Utah CBD Collective, right? And, and so, you're out. You yeah. can't boost or nothing. Hmm. Hmm. And it and they go two sites deep, right? So even if my social media page doesn't say anything about CBD or hemp, but my website then does. Which if yeah. I'm selling a product or talking about an ad or an article or have a link to somebody, shut you down. And that's the same for the payment space, right? Until just recently when banks opened up, the same thing. If if I'm accepting or, or making payments to a CBD company or a company within the realm, right? Whether mm -hmm. I'm selling CBD or not, mm. I can be shut down. Yeah, my Stripe account got shut down and I'm a medical clinic. <laughs> and yeah. I wrote him a letter and said, well, if, if I was a cancer center, would you shut me down? 
because I felt like mm-hmm. it's just the same stuff. Were you I, taking I mean, payments through Stripe? Is that what yeah, made them take it down? Yeah, I was taking payments mm-hmm. through Stripe. But you would assume that if you were a cancer center and you had a cannabis education place, maybe Stripe wouldn't shut you down. <laughs> maybe they would. I don't know. But that's what you're talking about. And so it's just like the general business practices, you know, same thing when they legalized hemp, but then banks not being on board and understanding the the amount of revenue that's being put into even processing facilities alone is should not be traveling on our roads and briefcases. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so tell me about this association that you have now, the Association of Associations. Of Hemp Associations. The yeah. Association of Hemp Associations globally. So I, I was at the, uh, the Zoom call mm-hmm, mm-hmm. when it was kind of being announced. Mm-hmm. So tell us about what, what it is and, and, and who's involved. So in this process with Utah CBD Collective, I realized real quick that CBD and Utah puts me in a corner for availability of what I'm actually able to do and, and changes that we're able to actually make in the industry. Um, and so again, I realized really fast that in this industry, the, the associations or other groups or organizations were divided by either product or region or a type of processing. There was not an association, to my knowledge, anywhere in the world that represents everything hemp. There may be a U.S. hemp or a U.S. home builders group or a, you know, Utah M- MJ Biz or a marijuana based group or a Nevada or Nebraska yeah. hemp association, right? But not anything really that runs across the big scale. So as I started to look into it um, and open my network, I it was presented to me an opportunity to join with nine other states to ask President Trump for $4.8 billion in infrastructure funding. Oh, wow. And so we're in the process of allocating um, grant money that can be used, and it's broken up for R&D, education, rural communities, textiles, processing, the whole thing. So from there, um, I've started to collect letters of support. So um, we've had 21 letters of support from some pretty big organizations and state organizations, um, as well as representatives that have sent us in. And then now we're starting to put POs together for funding. I've been introduced to somebody that's fabulous with the intent of broadcasting globally so that we can educate. Again, I think it goes back to how do we get education? You know, how do we go back almost in time to educating and getting information out and newspapers and radios are what are going to hit our rural communities. And so our goal is to provide support from ground up for everything in the hemp industry, building supplies, infrastructure, economic development, sustainability, diversity, all the buzzwords. Hmm. Wow. This is, I mean, this just, I just can't, I really can't and you, and wrap you're my starting mind around this. this. You, you, well, I've wrapped, I've, I've teamed up now with, um, I don't know if you know Dave Politis. Hmm. He's he does marketing with the Farm Bureau and outdoor retailers. He's done outdoor retailers. Yeah. He's in the, a marketing space. Joel Pl- Joel McKay Smith for yeah. rural and economic development and Ken Rivera right now. And then and I'll have a pretty now. big board, obviously. But right now I I really get probably five to ten inbound calls of interest in our association. There've been three other big associations globally that have reached out and we will service associations, businesses, profits, for profit. Wow. How long do you think a project like this takes to get it? Well, I mean, what's the goal? Uh, The goal is to change the marketplace, essentially worldwide. Mm -hmm. Look at like a a farm bureau, right? They have co-ops, they have chapters within regions. Um, I... I and Utah do not, or we in Utah do not have the same problems or concerns with growth as Alaska or as the Midwest, right? Their transportation need is going to be bigger than ours where we have an inland port, but we're not going to grow the acreage that they are, right? And so I think that each area needs to be represented. And so um, instead of competing with all of these other associations to take memberships, we want to support these associations because their needs are are, are different than ours. And I or 19 people on a board cannot service that. But if chapters just like 
the Farm Bureau can happen, right? I also imagine, Mm -hmm. and this is big picture thinking, right? When we talk how long, um, where our money comes in is where our, or where our steering committees direct us is where our attention goes. So we open these meetings up with the intent that once something that came up yesterday or last week that was really important for me is the concern of the number of uh, medical cards that nurse practitioners are allowed to write compared to physicians, right? Mm. We can um, we can clarify some of that right now if you want. Okay. Yeah. Well, point being though is if I get a committee that comes in that is heavy involved in that aspect yeah. and we need to lobby for that, that's where our attention goes, right? But Great. we can now guide the industry. We've coupled this with a hemp media company for that purpose that we can do market research and push content out based on what are our needs and what are they globally? And, you know, Alaska has only been legal to grow hemp for 120 days. They're an indoor grow. They can't grow outside. And so our problems are very different, but they definitely need that federal support and need. Right. Wait, Alaska, you've only been able to grow hemp for 120 days. Yeah. Hasn't been legal to smoke cannabis, like smoke THC up there for years. Yes. But you can only grow hemp. Yes. That's wild. It really is wild. Yeah. And when you talk about it on a global scale, you can see, like, if you understand the history of marijuana getting illegalized, Mm -hmm. that took a global, actually a global effort by many, many countries who essentially worked together in the end of the 20th century um, Mm -hmm. to, or the end of the 19th century. And then they... They essentially made it illegal in most places, and then it ended up being illegal here in the U.S. So you could see it going the other way, right? You you essentially need it to go the other way because we have all these grassroots movements, but you kind of need to put them together right? Well, on, and- a, on a national, on a global scale to really get the change that the that we all deserve. And we really talk about, you know, we talk about the industrial hemp market and the Midwest growing. It's grown there like a weed for years, right? For a hundred thousands of years. Mm-hmm. It just has been, you know, taught that if you touch it, you're going to get high, but they're going to need a processing plant or multiple processing plants. We may need one for our entire state. As an association, I would love to be able to provide that as a co-op for all of our our farms, all of our agriculture, right? right? So that now they have a, they have an outlet so that they're not losing their crop so that it's not so sensitive to freeze or to, you know, they can cut it down and it still be used. And and then we can buy the biomass and the waste and the pellets and carbon footprints. And yeah, there's so many things you can. Wow. What could listeners of our show, like people, what can we do? What can Tim and I do to help this start moving to get the ball going. What, what can we do here? Um, something that I'm really passionate about is putting the pieces together to Uh get these opportunities put in place down to understanding, you know, where's our capital, Mm. you know, who is out there that that's interested in getting involved and joining and showing up to our meetings. We open them up to the public and then allow you to get as involved as you want. Mm. We've divided the industry into 12 different sectors that we think need representation. So no matter who you are and what you want to do, you can, join all or one or a piece of it's it's up to you but i think really i mean i'm looking at putting manufacturing facilities in utah of hemp uh industrial hemp as well as a mill potentially because i would love to be able to buy build homes and make fabric so that we can have this ppe gowns and masks out of a micro antimicrobial fiber that'd be cool man. yeah it'd be dang cool man i remember back in like was it the 90s like hemp t-shirts like you know it's like oh and, and sure it seems like it's never really progressed further you know it's like you go get that hemp shirt or those hemp pants and that was it like i was always hoping to see you know go to smith's or go to winco and you would see made from hemp or made you know from, this you is know. something that's really i guess come up for me lately with this sex trafficking and the child labor laws and things like that. Uh You know, in the United States, we don't manufacture. There's, there aren't mills in the United States manufacturing fabrics. You know, they've all left the United States years ago. They were all in the North Carolina area and they're starting to come back. I know of two hemp mills, but you know, when we're paying pennies on the dollar for our fabric, there's an underlying issue that I think has been disclosed or brought to the surface for me a little bit and understanding when you're buying American made, you're paying your employees and bringing our supply chains back is 
bringing our economy, raising our economy and kind of nipping some of this child labor or human sure. trafficking labor, you know, for trafficking in the butt. Interesting. I'm on board. Yeah. yeah. If, it can, if it can get more, because I think that we've, we've lost the art of hemp in this country and cannabis in general, you know, I mean, if Betsy Ross made the flag out of hemp, hmm. which is true, mm-hmm. then, and they grew fields of it, fields of it, man. Name that movie. Ford's um, car was run on hemp. It was made and built out of hemp. Run on hemp, ran on hemp. Who's, whose car? Ford's. Yeah, it's, it's like, Ford's. That's, that's what yeah. you said. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. 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 And, and then we've kind of lost the ability to grow it, mm-hmm. process it, mm-hmm. you know, over the course of only a few generations, it seems like. And I have, I have a ton of family. You're talking about the Midwest in Minnesota. They're farmers and they're old dairy corn farmers and they're struggling. And it's like, come on guys, this would be cool if you can grow some hemp here. But you know, again, it goes back to where do they sell it to? How I think they, there's know? a lot of people now, um, that want to grow, but they, they don't know where to start. There's a lot of farmers, people with, I have 40 acres. I want to grow something. Who do I talk to? I talk to people like that all the time. Me too. Yeah. So do those people come and they watch your, they come to the meeting uh-huh. and they might be able to meet somebody who can put them in touch with somebody else who can say, okay, I could process that. If sure. you grow it, I'll process it. I would love to be that point of contact. My goal is to be that go-to for those resources, right? And so when we're hosting an event, we'll have- Again, this is big picture, right? But we'll have an event. We want to be like a, a, a consumer electronics. Everything under hemp, we want to be able to support and a place where you can go to for information and resources, you know, so that you know where that go to supply chain is. So that if you're going to grow, you know who your buyers are. Or if you're, you know, processing, you know who to go to to find more fiber. I know of like, right, like I said, right now, two big mills that are growing or buying from another country because there just isn't enough in the United States. And so. That's so wild. When, when hemp, you can transport. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, what about that guy? This was a while back that, that trucker that got busted in Idaho. Did you hear about that? I don't know. Oh, you heard about this, right? Yeah. I I don't know the whole story, but this guy got busted. This poor truck driver was just driving hemp through Idaho and ends up like. Going to prison yeah. or something. Oh, yeah. It. Yeah. I'm, I mean, but again, now you're back to this this question mark of like, do I really want to go into this business or is it safe to go into this business? Um, you know, if they could shut my account down and I have to do a bunch of stuff in cash, you can understand why people don't, they still don't want to do it. It's and an association yeah. needs to be formed so that we can, everybody can get together. That's right. Well, and that's teach where... the cop in Idaho to not pull you over. Well, and I think that those are big things that have to be addressed and they're both on the cannabis and the hemp side, right? So even if we're an association of hemp associations, putting some processes or policies in place that protect both the officer and the citizen that's being pulled over so that they know right from the start, whether or not you're intoxicated or whether or not they have a truck full of cannabis and the mafia are on their way, or if it's hemp and they're just transporting it for extraction. Right. Yeah. And so I think those types of things on both sides yeah, have, to have to be, finish. have to be well and have to be um, supported and validated. And there has to be, we have to combine in order for just like when it became illegal, you know, they joined forces to make change. We have to do the same thing. Yeah, man, there's a lot of work to do. I want to talk about one thing I, I do want to talk about, because I see this a lot with people, they'll try CBD, right? And I figure you might be a good person. Shoot, Tim might even know the answer for this, because I don't think we've no, talked about it this on the podcast. Isn't, I, I mean, I see where you're headed with this. No, well, where I'm headed is you get people, they don't, A, I mean, you can buy it everywhere. I mean, you can go to the gas station, buy some CBD. I can go, I mean, you sell CBD here at your, at Oh yeah, you? like three different so, types. They're all different prices. They, some, you know, you'll get a bottle and they're usually not cheap. You'll try the bottle and you'll be like, hey, this doesn't work or this is garbage or this does work. But then they try, like, how do you know what to buy? How do you know what's good? I think this goes back to to education, right? We a lot of times buy on impulse and buy on, well, my mom's sister told me that it made her brother walk and he, she used to have a broken back and now she's walking. And so it's (laughs) got to work, right? Exactly. I love it. But 
I can't tell you how many of those stories I've heard and then yeah. seen the bottle and there's no label as to a COA or a, um, there's no lab test associated. And yeah. understanding what hemp does and how it remediates the soil and how the metal and the pesticides are pulled right into the plant or the way that it's processed affects things. I think it came down to understanding what you're looking for and on the label what you know, what type of lab tests are available for you to know almost the track to trace, you know, from seed to shelf, where your plant's been and how it's been processed. And is that information available to you? But as far as how it works for you, I don't know. Everybody's different too. That's the, that's the problem too. Well, and it's, yeah. And if you're a regular user of cannabis compared to a first time user of a CBD oil. And, and I have a hard time because what's on the shelf um, has been grossly missold. You know, there's this perception to take one drop of CBD and it's all you need. And I'm a firm believer that you need significantly more than what most bottles are prescribing. Well, Epidiolex is 1500 milligrams of CBD. So if you're buying a vial and, you know, and it's 10 milligrams of CBD. And yeah, I mean, that's what I go back to. I, mm-hmm. I, I agree with you mm-hmm. because when you need a therapeutic dose and that dose is X for the seizure disorder, the right. dialex, right? Right. So this goes back to the regulation on the vitamin versus the drug though, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The vitamin has no regulation. Mm-hmm. Who knows what's in the bottle? They can put kind of put whatever they want, but now that it's a medicine you would think that they would want to regulate like what's in the bottle. Well, and it's hard because different terpenes affect affect different things, right? And it's hard too, because we put it out on the market with years of not being able to research it to know uh, like Delta 8. Delta right? 8's new, Who knew? right? I mean, how many more cannabidiol, cannab- cannabinoids? It's the end of the day. I know what I know what you're talking about. I know what you. Yeah, we got you. I know what you meant. (laughs) You know those things that you can't advertise with that. Yeah, those. Yes, it is. CBD is an interesting thing. I mean, I've heard so many crazy stories. I remember hearing a a story of a of 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 some mom out in Eagle Mountain or something getting kicked out the school board for using CBD, and then yeah. a grandma at Disneyland getting in trouble for having CBD. It's like, come on. Yeah, patient spouses will come in. They'll say, uh, you know, I work. Well, I'm sorry, I'm I am in the Air Force or something yeah. like that. I work on base. I can't take CBD. But it won't like, show up in your uh, system, right? Uh, and they're like, nope, even the 0% stuff. You're right. It all comes down to education. It's this barrier, yeah. And it really is, again, another reason that I think that this pandemic opened up, that be aware of what you're taking and why you're yeah. taking it and what you're looking for. You know, if I'm looking for a something to just a daily dose to just kind of take the ease off, right? Versus really treating something. Um, if I'm going through, say, divorce, when I was going through my divorce, it was very different than my emotions now. And I assume what I would consume would be very different. And so, yeah, yeah you I also, point. you also have a hard time too. And you have to take this into consideration when I'm growing a crop, right? And I put a product out, my product that I receive three years later is not going to be the same product that I tried now, or we have not figured out how to do that. Even though I'm mixing it the same, it's the same 10 milliliters of this and 10 grams of this and whatever, however you mix it um, with, with MTC oil or coconut oil or whatever, you still, the way you grew it in your batch, it's going to have a different terpene profile and it's going to have a different CBD content. And it's hard to that that consistency as a consumer is hard, right? Is you know you go into the store and from one one month to the next you may buy a different product. How do you really manage your medicine and your dosage for what you're treating yourself for? Yeah. Oh yeah, this is the reason why you can't. It's hard to do studies on a specific a symptom or a specific disease and cannabis because you're getting different profiles in every plant. Yeah. But that's a, again, it comes back to no other industry. Is that an issue? Mm-hmm. That's true. <laughs> you were talking about education. You do a daily uh, show on Facebook. Mm-hmm. You mentioned YouTube because so our listeners can check this out because they could probably learn a ton from this. Yeah. How can people find this? What is this show about? 
So oh, right yeah. now we're at Utah streaming through Utah CBD Collective. Okay. Next week we'll be streaming through AHA. Funny enough, our association of hemp associations, we're going to market with a bunch of AHA moments around hemp. Nice. And so we will, um, we're building out our social media now. Um, for the next couple of months, we'll stream actively through both. So at Utah CBD Collective or Association of Hemp Associations on social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. And then, yeah, we, it's become searchable content. You can look up any of the professionals that we've interviewed, any of the topics. Um, they're all saved. And how long have you, how long have you been doing this for? Just since our, we shut down. So about for three months, I've interviewed almost a hundred people. You're just having the time of your life. You're loving it. Actually, I feel like I'm doing my one-on-ones live. I love talking to people and meeting with people. Um, and so now I just feel like I'm sharing the opportunity to build relationships. I have countless number of people that have reached back out and done business because of our show. Yeah. That's the biggest thing for me is I'm creating revenue or a, a revenue opportunity where people in the industry can actually connect and build a relationship. Well, yeah. it also goes back to your talking about advertising and getting that out. I mean, that's why doing a podcast and by doing a, you know, a live Facebook show or whatever you do, you know, an, an Instagram channel, whatever people are doing, that's how we're going to get the name out and get it people educated and get the get the information out there. You said something earlier, you know, about the conversation of people can't come in and um, or when people come in, they don't want to try any products because they're in the military uh, or whatever. Yeah. You know, it really is a normalizing of the conversation and even just identifying that if somebody is taking uh, using a hemp lotion, they're using a cannabis product. If somebody is using CBD, they're using cannabis. Um, that just because you're smoking it, uh, you know, the smokers are not the only consumers or the only ones right. using cannabis, that it's everywhere and it's here to stay. It's not going away. And the industry is so much bigger than CBD, right? It is, there's so many more benefits to it. So are you saying the war on drugs did not work? <laughs> I'm just kidding, kidding. It was funny. Somebody actually just posted online. I saw this on Facebook. I thought they got rid of D.A.R.E. years ago. I guess D.A.R.E. has made a comeback or something. Really? Like, oh, gosh, really? dang it. You know, I, 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 that I'm going to have to go is, get my old pamphlet out. That stuff is so silly. The Reef for Madness and the D.A.R.E. and the gateway drug stuff, I just laugh at it. Well, it, I mean, it, it, mm-hmm. it really is. It's just... It's made a bad word for, for hemp and for CBD. I mean, there's no reason that anybody should be afraid yeah, to true. use it. Yeah, that's true. Up until uh, when I went to an IHC, um, an Intermountain Healthcare CME, uh, let's see, a medical education conference on uh, the medical marijuana program, they have copies. They brought copies of old hemp um, certificates in Utah that were issued for the government having people grow hemp when that pro- program was still around the 60s and 70s, I think. But then again, we just, we've lost it. Well, and it's it's funny because our generations, it wasn't around for, right? Nope. But it's not new. It's not a new product. It's our technology, our diesel engines were made for hemp, right? It's not, it's just coming back. But it, it's scary because a perfect example, I have, a, I have an older aunt, right? And she gets nervous of anything with hemp because she has such a bad experience because of THC and people, you know, marijuana, you know, yeah. and, and that's what they know. And that's why we need to change it. But uh, anyway, we're on the I don't road. Know. We're on the path. Is it what, as we kind of wrap it up, was there anything you were hoping we would talk about that we didn't get a chance to talk about? Cause I know there's so much we could talk about Mandy. No, it feels different being on the opposite side. Yeah. I get nervous. Right. How, <laughs> how can listeners like, get involved how can they find your the, the about your your meetings your you know your networking events that you do i'll post them on eventbrite so they'll be searchable also okay. but really through our social media platforms and then our website Just association with you yep. of hemp there. association yeah and, and the cbd collective find yep and mandy kerr you can follow, follow me on social media i post a lot about the links and share the links often uh, LinkedIn. I've started to put a lot of content out about LinkedIn, LinkedIn, and so feel free to okay, reach out. Okay, cool. There. LinkedIn would be a good place to probably, especially for what what you're doing with oh, all the business absolutely. people. Anything, anything in the uh, cannabis space that you want to talk about before we oh, wrap so up? So by tomorrow. So last week we released the, the episode with Wholesome. Yeah, and then they didn't open, but they are open. So when today, this releases yesterday or today they opened. today they open today, today at noon. So today, so when this airs. 
uh, wholesome will be open and bountiful. Man, that's yeah. some serious housekeeping. It took them four 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 inspections. There was a and little resistance. In this is the that thing: city. is it was it wasn't their fault. There was I, I saw a lot of people think it was their fault. It wasn't Wholesome's fault. No, it really wasn't. I'm, I mean, the, I think I think it just goes to show you that there's still some resistance to yeah. opening up a medical pharmacy in Utah and yeah. certain cities and individuals, you know, make sure that that resistance is known. You don't that's, know when the next pharmacy why. that's opening, do you, by chance? No, I don't. I know the addresses of a lot, and I know I've driven past them all in the past three weeks, and I can tell you I, I, there is not one that's very close to being open I would say it's going to be another two months. Oh, really? See, I thought weekends. a bunch more were opening up this month. That's what it's, I, I mean, they say that, but it's just like Wholesome. They tried to open in the middle of July and, and it ended up having to be pushed back. And so I think with the construction industry is really busy. There's all kinds of things that are pushing against people opening. So I, I, my guess is two months. I cannot believe the economic development in Utah. Somebody told me today that uh, we have about 10,000 new people moving in a month. That's yeah. crazy. Our growth. That's so crazy. I'm curious about how you, how do you suspect or how do you see the pharmacies being able to keep up with the supply and demand, the need they for They won't product? be able to keep up. And I don't think so. Um, I don't think they'll be able to keep up with the demand once the demand hits. Uh, I, you know, at the earliest two years, but at the latest five years, that's my prediction is that we will know a little more in two years. They'll be able to keep up for two years. They can't keep up now because there's a, there's just an, uh, the, there's no balance right now, right. but as soon as all 14 are open, right. we'll be able to, they'll be able to keep up. And I think they'll be able to keep up for two years, but uh, they won't be able to keep up forever, but it'll be interesting to see whether the state wants to really control that or whether they open it up and let the cities control it or if they change the rules. Or if we just go recreational, Tim. I mean, I twenty twenty one, buddy. Next you can year, go to adult use eventually. Next year, you think? But you can't. Uh, you think we will? I, I, I think will, it's. I think once we get Democrats in in an office is is when we're going to see it. See, I think now that we've interviewed Mandy, I yeah. think there's so much work to do yeah. when you talk about like, okay, let's get down to brass tacks about what has to happen before it's legalized. Well, Biden already said I mean, he wants to decriminalize hemp, it. You well, look fix at regulation. Look at liability for something like salmonella or botulism. Yeah. How do you know if I'm buying 15 small crops to make one batch and I sell it to Walgreens and Walgreens now distributes botulism, who do you blame? Right. Like I think there's so much, so many rules like that to fix yeah. that you can't just legalize it. Right. It's, it's not- The risk is too feasible. high. In my opinion, the if we're talking about risk from the government, like look, consider that. I get that some of it doesn't make sense, but- same for me. If I have a huge business, before I bring anything in, I want to make sure I'm no longer at risk. And I think that that's, that's that conversation that is being had. With with uh, legalizing, you mean? Yeah, with everything yeah. around it, you know, about products, right. about distribution well, products. And that's that's why I'm fine with it. Biden wants to just decriminalize it. So that's sure. why I'm fine with that. I mean, I'm fine with yeah, that. Yeah, I think that that comes first. That's kind of what yeah. I'm what I'm learning as I'm as I'm really getting more involved in this industry as a whole is decriminalizing seems to be the yeah. next thing you you can do because then you can allow people to talk about it, bank about it, do contracts about it. Yes. Like all of these things that yes. we were having trouble with before. Now at least you can do that. Then we can work out those kinks totally. before we go letting and everybody- And we can study it. You know, one thing that's a big concern for me is these farmers that are, you know, trying new genetics. And if they go hot early, they're doomed. But how do we how do we allow for R and D and not a little bit of leeway on right? What they it, go when, hot, you say, which means they're not hemp anymore, and now they're now they're, they're above marijuana. the point three yes. percent, right? And now but in genetics, right, right. But when we're hmm. trying to develop genetics, especially for industrial hemp here, right, there's a chance right. we will go hot. And how do you how do you figure that out? And so those types of things that I think decriminalizing would be very beneficial. And think of all the jobs. This would open. I mean, that's again, again, why I think, I mean, granted, I don't want everything going on that's happening right now with, with 
even people losing jobs. But that's why I think this is a good opportunity for us to push this because it would start it. It would, it would open up a ton of jobs. Thousands and thousands yeah. and thousands and, of jobs. And, yeah, and exactly. revenue, like, I mean, Utah alone with the inland port, if we're manufacturing hemp here, all of our farmers can grow. We can manufacture different, but then we can ship it anywhere in the world. Exactly. Right. Right. Now we can put, we can, yeah, hempcrete blocks. We can, there's lots. And even if all we do is take care of our tribes, all we do is take care of our rural communities. We can employ, we can, yeah, yeah. pretty much reverse a lot of damage. So Okay. So for sure we're having Mandy back. Yeah, no. Because I, I, this I, thing no. changes so rapidly. Yeah, we're no, going to need I mean, it, it, <laughs> as long as she's willing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. You are. Yeah, for you sure. Know, and and I can't urge uh, listeners go connect with Mandy. Yeah, please uh, get involved and let's make magic happen. Yeah, absolutely. How can people okay. get a hold of you, Tim? Let's wrap uh, this up. Yeah, utahmarijuana dot org. We post all the podcasts there as soon as they're transcribed, and you can get a hold of me there. Reach out. We actually have a little uh, self screening. If you want to go to the website, do the self screening. It has questions on there to see whether or not you would qualify for a medical card. It's kind of fun. Interesting. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So go there. Check yeah. We it put out. It, We kind of put a, a little algorithm there for people to kind of help because the biggest question we have is, do I qualify for a card? So we've put a little, well, what kind of a little one quiz. Of the qualifying conditions? We have the qualifying conditions <laughs> and then we have, qual- we basically have those linked okay, in, in okay, ways to okay. help people kind of decide <laughs> on their own. Whether or not they want to call us. I got you. And you're still up in Kaysville, right? You're working yeah, out Yeah, still there. in Kaysville. Ogden opening September 1st. So we'll have three places. And then uh, I Am Salt Lake Podcast is my other podcast I do with my wife. Go listen to that. We just put up an episode. Uh, my mind is blank. Oh, this this lady who, uh, the Salt Lake Culinary Education. Oh, uh, yeah. I uh, like that place. Team uh, building. Yeah, man. But what's cool is they do these like meal kits. So it's kind of like uh, like uh, those meal kit boxes you can do, but they do it out of there, man. Oh, wow. So you can get local, like a Blue Apron, right? Isn't that the meal kit one that people get right? like nationwide? But they have a, like, a, like a local one. Salt Lake you, Culinary Education. Yeah. Slice.com, Slice, I think is their yeah. website. But, yeah, but, they're yeah. right above. Uh, they're like on 3rd East. Yeah, man. So- that was a fun, fun podcast. So go check that out. We're here every week with Utah in the Weeds. Every Friday, I try to drop a new episode. So make sure to uh, subscribe in whatever app you're in. We should actually, Amazon is opening up, Tim. We should be in Audible soon. Oh, that's going to be Audible is opening up a brand new podcast uh, thing. So we should be in there in Pandora soon. And leave us a review in iTunes. And Stay anything else you guys want to say? Do you want to say anything else, Mandy, before we let you go? Can I real quick? One yeah. thing that I want yeah. to talk about is... For anybody wanting to get into the industry, the opportunity for the STEM, women in STEM or rural or uh, communities, there is a ton of funding, a ton of funding available. And so when we look at grants and money like that for R&D or economic development or education around the hemp, there is a lot of available money. Very cool. Oh, way cool. That's awesome. All right, guys. See you next week.